Welcome back to this series on topology. In today's video, we'll continue our look at compactness and prove some important properties about compact spaces. As always, you can find the playlist containing all the videos of this series by clicking on the info thing that should appear right now. Also, if you enjoy these videos, please consider liking them so that other people can find them more easily. The five properties we'll prove are the following. The first says that closed subsets of a compact space are compact. The second one says that compact subsets of a house door space are closed. The third one says that compact subsets of metric spaces are bounded. And then the fourth property says that finite products of compact spaces are again compact. And finally, quotients of compact spaces are also compact. So as you can see, these properties um, interconnect things we've seen before, like the concept of being a closed subset, the concept of a house door space, and then also the concept of compact subsets and spaces. And this means that these properties will help us identify compact subsets. For example, if we know that we have some closed subset of a compact space, then we can infer that this subset will be compact itself. Now, in order to prove these properties, we'll need two lemmas, which we'll have to prove first. And both of them are a bit technical, especially the second one. So if you get a bit overwhelmed during the proof of those lemmas, don't worry about it. All we'll need will be the results, which will be then used to prove these properties, which are the things that are actually important for this video. Okay, so let's start with the first lemma that we'll need. So this is essentially a generalization of the Hausdorff property for compact subsets. Recall that a Hausdorff space, let's call it x, has the following defining property. Namely, if we take any two points in x, so we have some point here, let's say um, a, and some other point here b, provided that they're distinct, then there exist open sets, well, one open set containing a, and another open set containing b, that are disjoint from one another. One way to express this in words is that points in a Hausdorff space can be separated by open sets. Now, the following lemma is a generalization of this, where we replace the points A and B by compact subsets. Hence, the setup is essentially the same. We have some Hausdorff space X, but now we consider compact subsets. So this will be a compact subset, which I'll denote by capital A. And then we have another compact subset, capital B. And now this lemma claims that we can separate these compact subsets by open sets. So what would that mean? Well, it means we can find an open set that contains the compact set capital A and another one that contains the compact set capital B. And moreover, these two open sets are disjoint from one another. With this analogy in mind, let's read the statement. So it says that let x be a Hausdorff space, so we require x to be Hausdorff, and we consider two subsets a and b of x that are disjoint and compact. Then the lemma claims that there exist disjoint open subsets u and v, such that a is contained in u and b is contained in v. So that's exactly like in the picture I drew below. We have two compact subsets, namely a and b, which are subsets of a Hausdorff space X. And then we find two open sets, which are also disjoint, U and V, one of which contains A and the other one of which contains B. For the proof of this lemma, we start with a special case, namely where B just is a point. So I'll draw the picture here on the side again so that we have some idea of what's happening. So in our case, we just take B to be a point. So it's just a subset consisting of a single point. And A can be a general compact subset of the space X. Let's briefly think about why this is a special case. So we're assuming that this subset A is compact, but why is this point B here compact? Well, we just need to think back to what it means to be a compact subset of a space. It means that any open cover of that subset has a finite subcover. But of course, any open cover of, well, this point B will have to contain that point B in one of the covering subsets. And in fact, you can just restrict to only taking that subset and it'll still be a cover because B is contained in it. 
So points are always compact subsets of any space. In fact, we saw in the previous video that you can extend this to say that any finite subset is compact because um, you can always restrict to open sets that contain each of the points and that'll be a finite subcollection of that original open cover. Okay, so let's write down what we did here. So we consider the case where B is just a singleton. And well, A is as in the statement of the proposition, so it's a compact subset of X and it needs to be disjoint from B so the set A will not contain the point small b. Now what we're going to do is the following. We're going to choose an arbitrary point P in the set capital A and use the Hausdorff property. So small p and small b are distinct points of X because small b does not lie in A. And hence, because X is Hausdorff, we can find open neighborhoods that separate these two points from one another. So we have some open neighborhood of small p, which I'll call up, and some open neighborhood of small b, which I'll call vp, which are disjoint from one another. Now I've tried to draw this in sort of a general way, so the neighborhood around p doesn't necessarily have to contain all of the set capital A. It just has to contain the point small p. Hence we've let p be some point in A, and then there are open disjoint subsets um, up and vp. So p is an element of up and b is an element of vp. Moreover, this point p in a was arbitrary, so we can repeat the same procedure for each point in a. And what we get from repeating this is a collection of open neighborhoods, um, up for each point in um, a, and these will cover the entire subset a. So the collection of these ups where p runs in a, this is an open cover Um, of the subset A. Why is this? Well, each of these is open because, well, the Hausdorff property gives us disjoint open subsets, and it covers A because we're running over each of the points P and A. So remember that UP always contains the point P, and, well, we have one UP for each point in A, so every point in A is contained in one of these uh, subsets. Apart from this collection of UPs, here we also have a collection of VPs where um, each UP is disjoint from each corresponding VP. All right, so now we've constructed an open cover of the set A, and we now remember that we assumed A to be a compact set. Hence, we can now come up with a finite subcover of this cover here. So by compactness of A, There exists a finite subcover, so this means that there exist some up1 up to some upk, so a collection here, uh, which still covers A. Now the idea is that we're going to union together all of these open sets, so they still cover A, so if we union all of them together, we'll get a larger open set which contains A. And that's part of what we wanted, right? So in the proposition, we're trying to find disjoint open subsets U and V, one of which contains A and the other one of which contains B. So we're going to let U be the union of these UPI, where I runs from one to K. So we've just union together all of these open sets we've obtained as a finite subcover of this original open cover. Okay, so we've got sort of half of what we want. The other half is that we want a, another set V, which um, is open, disjoint from this set U here, and moreover contains the point B. Now remember that for each 
of these sets UPI here, we have a corresponding set VPI, which is disjoint from it. And moreover, each of these VPIs contains B. So the way we're going to get um, the desired set V is by intersecting all of the VPIs that correspond to these UPIs here. So we let V equal the intersection, I going from one to K of VPI. And again, this VPI here is the corresponding open subset we got by the Hausdorff property that corresponds to UPI. Now the remaining thing we need to do is just to check that the sets U and V that I've defined here actually satisfy the requirements of the lemma. So first of all, we need to check that they're disjoint, and this will follow from the fact that each of the UPI is disjoint from its corresponding VPI. To see this in more detail, let's suppose that X lies in V, so lies in this intersection of the VPIs. Well, this implies that X would be an element of VPI for all I. On the other hand, suppose X also lies in U, so X lies within this union of the UPI. Now, lying in the union means that you lie in one of the sets that's being unioned over, so this would imply that X is an element of, let's call it UPJ, for some J. Well, but now because X lies in VPI for every I in particular, we have that X lies in VPJ, but this now gives us a contradiction because VPJ is the open set corresponding to UPJ that we obtained from the Hausdorff property, and those are disjoint. So this is a contradiction. We can't have X lying both in VPJ and UPJ. Therefore, it's not possible to have some X which lies both in V and in U, and this proves that U and V are disjoint. Okay, so we've shown that these uh, two sets U and V are disjoint. We need to show further that they're open. So U here is just a union of open sets, UPI, so it's open. And V here is a intersection of open sets, VPI. And importantly, it's a finite intersection. And recall that it's the case that finite intersections of open sets are open, but not necessarily infinite intersections. So we see that here the compactness is crucial because we've reduced this infinite collection here to a finite collection, which allowed us to construct a set V by a finite intersection rather than an infinite one. So this entire argument would sort of still work if you didn't have compactness. You could still get U, like a set U as a union of some, of some UPIs and V as an intersection of VPIs, and they'd still be disjoint but we wouldn't be sure that V here would be open if this intersection here would be infinite. Luckily, however, because of compactness, we can reduce this to a finite intersection and therefore V is open. Okay, so we're almost done with uh, checking the properties. So the last thing we need to check is that A is contained in U and B is contained in V. The fact that A is contained in U follows from the fact that these UPIs here are an open cover of A. So by definition, this means that their union contains A. So that's fine. And finally, we need to check that B is contained in V. In our case, in this special case here, B is just the singleton containing the point small b. And this is contained in every one of the VPIs by the way we've constructed them. And therefore, it's also contained in their intersection. All right, so we've proved the lemma for the special case where one of the sets is just a point. And now we want to show the general case where both sets could be arbitrary compact subsets of X. So we now let A and B be arbitrary. And from the previous, we know that for each point in B, so I'll say for each small b in the set B, we can find disjoint open subsets, which I'll call UB and VB, 
such that A is contained in UB and the point small b is an element of VB. So maybe I should draw some picture again. So we have again our space X and we have a compact set A and now a general compact set B. These are still disjoint from one another. And I'm saying that for each point small b in the set B, we can apply the special case we had before and find some open set that contains A and an open set that contains this point small b, and these two open sets are disjoint from one another. And now I'm calling the set that contains A, UB, and the set that contains the point small b, VB. Now we sort of repeat the same procedure um, we did before, but now for the set capital B. So we note that this point small b here we chose was arbitrary, so we can do the same thing for every point in the set capital B, and this again gives us a collection of subsets VB, which are an open cover of the set capital B. So the collection VB for small b in B is an open cover, and hence it has a finite subcover Let's call this VB1 up through VBK. And this finite subcover exists because capital B is a compact set. We can now do the analogous thing we did in the previous special case. So we let V be the union of all the VBIs, where I runs from 1 to K, and U will be the intersection of all the UBIs Again, i running from 1 to k. And here, again, the ubi is the set corresponding to vbi under this procedure above. Now, the fact that the u and v we've constructed in this way are disjoint is exactly the same argument as in the special case. The fact that they're open is, again, a consequence of the fact that, well, in this case for v, we're unioning open sets, so that's fine. And in the case of u, we're intersecting a finite number of open sets, so u will again be open. And finally, b is contained in v because these vbi are an open cover of b, and a is contained in u because a is contained in each of the ubis we've constructed here. So this proves the lemma. Now if you think back to how the proof worked, we're generalizing the Hausdorff property, which says that we can separate points in a Hausdorff space, and we sort of managed to generalize this to making A, this point small a, a compact set, capital A, in one step, and then we further managed to expand small b to a compact set, capital B, in the second step. So we've kind of blown up A in the first step and then blown up B in the second step, and essentially both of the steps use the same idea, which was taking unions and intersections of the separating sets. And compactness was essential because we needed to reduce some possibly infinite collection to a finite collection in order for the intersection of that collection to again be open. This next lemma will be essential for proving the fact that products of compact spaces are again compact. However, the lemma itself is a bit technical and probably is not particularly useful outside of that context. Nonetheless, we'll prove it here so that the proof of the property about the product of the compact spaces will be shorter later. The lemma says that if we have any space x and some compact space y, and moreover we have a point small x in x and some open subset u that contains this line x times y, then there is a neighborhood v of this point small x and moreover, this neighborhood is uh, a neighborhood in the set capital X, such that if we take the product of this neighborhood V with Y, this thing is contained within the open set U. Okay, so that's quite a mouthful. So I'll draw the picture so that we can understand what this statement means. So we suppose that we have some space X 
which I'll sort of draw schematically here almost as a line. And we're not assuming anything about this base x. And then we also have some space y, which we assume to be compact. What we're doing now is considering parts of the product space x times y, which I'll draw schematically like this. So now the next part says that we choose a point small x in x, and we consider some open set u of the product space, which contains this set of the singleton x times y. So the set singleton x times y, we can think of as this line here in this picture. So this is singleton x times y. And we consider some open set u, which contains this set. So this red set is u. All right, so that's the setup of the lemma. And well, if we have this setup, then the lemma claims that there exists a neighborhood v of small x in the set x, such that if we consider the product of this neighborhood v with y, then that's still contained in the open set u. So in our drawing, we want to find some neighborhood of x. So this green set would be v, such that if we take the product of this set v with y, that entire thing is still contained within u. And this product will look like a tube that runs around this line x times y. So for this reason, this lemma is also called the tube lemma, because we start with some open set u in the product that contains this line, and we can find a tube around this line that still fits within that open set. Okay, so now that we've hopefully understood the statement, we'll try to give the proof, which turns out to not actually be that long or complicated. We start by noticing that for each point small y and y, there are open sets. Um, we have some open set v, which is a subset of x, and this contains the point small x. And we have some open set w, which is a subset of y, which contains the point small y. And moreover, the product v times w is contained in u. Now, why is this the case? Well, this essentially follows directly from the definition of the product topology on x times y. So for this, we recall that the collection of sets, let's call them a times b, where a in x is open and b and y is open. So this is a basis for the topology, so for the product topology on um, the space x times y. So in particular, this means that any open set of the product space x times y can be expressed as a union of these types of products of open sets in X and in Y. So in particular, if you take any point in U, since U is open, we can find some open set that is a neighborhood of that point and which is contained in U. And moreover, that neighborhood will be a union of sets of the form A times B, where A is open in X and B is open in Y. And now if we choose um, specifically the point, let's choose the point x comma y for small y, well then again there will be a neighborhood around this point that is contained in u, and this neighborhood will be a union of these product sets, and we can just choose one of those product sets which contains the point x, y, and well that will give us this uh, product v times w. So if this seems mysterious to you, maybe go back and review the video on product spaces. But in any case, we've now chosen an arbitrary point small y and y, and we're now sort of looking at the point x comma y on this line. And what we've done is we found some set here, 
which is v times w, where v is a subset of x and w is a subset of y. Okay, now the next thing we'll notice is that the space where we take the singleton x and take the product with y is homeomorphic to y itself. Essentially, here in this space, we've just tagged every point in y with an additional x. And, well, there's an obvious bijection between the two, we just map x, y to y. Moreover, the open sets here in this space where we've tagged everything with an x are essentially just the same as the open sets in the space y, where everything, again, is tagged with an x over here. In any case, since these two spaces are homeomorphic, we conclude that uh, this space here is also compact, since y is. Hence, we know that this space singleton x times y is compact. Now, the way we're going to use this compactness is again by constructing an open cover of this space and reducing it to a finite subcover. Now, the way we're going to get this open cover is similar to what we did in the previous lemma, so for every point y in the space capital Y, we can find such a product set v times w, and now we can just let y vary, and this will give us a family of um, open sets which cover the space singleton x times y. So let's maybe um, index these sets we've obtained here. So we say that for each point small y in y, we can find some open set vy in x and some open set wy in capital Y, such that vy times wy is a subset of u. So in our picture, I'll also add the indexing. And now we let y vary, and this gives us a collection of open sets which cover um, this line singleton x times y. Therefore, the collection of the vy's times the wy's, where we let y run throughout the entire set capital Y, is an open cover of this space, the singleton x times y. Hence, there is a finite subcover which I'll call vy1 times wy1 up through vyk times wyk. Okay, so in our picture, essentially, we've covered this orange line with some of these white squares. And each of these white squares is contained in the red set u. Okay, and now from the picture, it should maybe be clear what we need to do in order to get this green tube. So what we need to do is we need to intersect all of these horizontal um, sets here. And this will then produce a tube that lies within u. And what does intersecting these horizontal sets here mean? Well, it means we set v to be the intersection of these v, y, i, where i runs from 1 to k. So let's see if this v satisfies what we want in the lemma. So we want v to be a neighborhood of the point small x and x. So in particular, v must contain the point x. But this is the case because x is contained in each of the v, y's. So, I mean, it's contained in each of these v, y, i's, and therefore it's contained in their intersection. Next, we want this V to be open. So here, implicitly, when I'm saying neighborhood, I always mean open neighborhood. Maybe I can put this into the statement. So there's an open neighborhood V of X. Why is this open? Well, each of these V, Y, I, it was open. And hence, because we're taking a finite intersection, the intersection is also open. Then the final thing we need is that the product V times Y be contained in U. And this follows from the fact that each of these products of vyi times wyi is contained in u. To see this in a little more detail, let's zoom in onto this tube here. So I'm sort of 
drawing a zoomed in view. So we have this tube and this is the line which comes from the singleton x times y. And down here, sort of the width of this tube is v. And what we now want to show is that v times y, so this tube, is contained in the set u. Now in order to do this, we pick some arbitrary point which lies in v times y, for example, this white point here. And what we now do is we consider the point where it intersects, so where the y-coordinate intersects this line. Now we know from here that these vyi times wyi cover this line x times y, and hence this point, which I've marked with an x, has to be contained in some one of these product sets. So this white set here I'm drawing is some vyi times wyi. Now I want to argue that this same set will also contain the original point here we were interested in. Why is this the case? Well, it contains this intersection point on the horizontal y-coordinate. So basically the y-coordinate part of this set is will be always okay, but it's possible that this set here, this square, could not be wide enough so that like it looks like something like this. And in that case, it wouldn't contain this point. But in fact, that's not possible because we know that this V here, so the width of this tube, is the intersection of all of the widths of these squares. So basically, each of the squares has to be at least as wide as V. Therefore, this square actually has to be at least as wide as V, so it contain at least all of the um, points along this horizontal line. And therefore, in particular, it'll also contain that point there. You could write this out in a bit more detail if you wanted to make sure that this actually works, but I think it's uh, not particularly illuminating to write that entire argument out. So I think it's pretty clear from this picture here, if you have this finite number of boxes, each of the boxes is contained in U. And basically you take the intersection of all of the widths of the boxes to be the width of your tube. Well, then the tube must lie entirely within U as well because the tube lies within all of the boxes and all of the boxes lie within U. All right, so with that, I'll declare this lemma proved. And again, this is just a technical result that will be necessary in order to prove that the product of compact spaces is again compact. So if you didn't quite follow everything that was going on here, maybe just look at the picture and sort of think about the general idea, but the details really aren't that important. We're now finally in a position to prove the main proposition, the first part of which states that closed subsets of compact spaces are again compact. So we start by supposing that X is compact. And that we have some closed subset A of X. The way we're going to prove compactness is by this characterization of compact subsets we saw in the previous video. Namely, we need to show that every open cover of A has a finite subcover. So we let u be an open cover of A. So we note that x without u is open. This is because A is a closed set, so its complement is open by definition. And hence, if we consider the collection of the open cover u, unioned with this extra set x without a, so we're just adding this set to the collection, this will be an open cover of x. So let's think briefly about why this is the case. So we saw that x without a is an open set of x, and we know that all of the elements of u are open sets of X as well because they form an open cover of A. So the only thing we need to check is that this new collection U 
plus this set x without a actually covers x. So for this, we choose some arbitrary point in the set capital X. And well, if this point lies in a, well, then it's covered by some set in u because u is an open cover of a. On the other hand, if x does not lie within a, then it lies within this set x without a. And hence, it's also covered by this augmented collection here where we've added this set x without a. Therefore, indeed, this collection here is an open cover of x. Now, since x is compact, this collection here, which is an open cover, will have a finite subcover. So because x is compact, we have a finite subcover, which I'll call u1 up to uk, and then also x without a. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be the case that x without a would be part of any finite subcover, but if it isn't, we can always add it. And well, we've just added one element, so the subcover will still be finite and we don't affect the covering properties. I mean, it's always okay to add more elements to your subcover. So we can assume that our finite subcover is of this form. But really the important part is that we've reduced the amount of the u's to a finite number, namely just k of them here, and now because this finite subcover, so this is a finite subcover of x, this cover is x, and from this it now will follow that actually the u1 through uk will cover a. So the claim is that this collection just containing u1 through uk um, covers a. To see that this is the case, we let a be an arbitrary point in the set capital A, which we know to be a subset of x. And now because this collection here, which maybe I'll call V, so this is a cover of x, we know that there's some element of this cover V, which contains the point small a. So then there is an element of V containing a. But now if you look at the elements of V, so we have these u i through u k, but we also have x minus a, but x without a can't contain a because, well, it's the complement of a and x. So since x minus a is disjoint from a, we must have that sum of ui actually contains a. And hence, we've found some element of this u1 through uk, which contains a, which shows that this collection covers a. All right, so in conclusion, this ui through uk is the desired uh, finite subcover. All right, so this property says that whenever you have a compact space and you have a closed subset of that space, then you can be sure that that subset itself is also compact. And this is really useful in practice. Let's move on to the next part of the proposition, which says that compact subsets of a Hausdorff space are closed. So this is sort of like a partial converse to the previous thing we saw. We saw that if we have a compact space, then its closed subsets are compact. So we have some implication of the form closed implies compact in the context of a compact space. And now here, we, if we're in a Hausdorff space, which is not necessarily compact, but we have a compact subset, then we can infer that that compact subset is closed. So here we have an implication of the form compact implies closed. So in particular, if you would combine both of these, and you would look at compact Hausdorff spaces, then subsets of those would be compact if and only if they're closed. For the proof of this property, we'll need the lemma that we proved before about being able to separate compact subsets in a Hausdorff space. We suppose 
that x is Hausdorff. And that A is a compact subset of X. Now what we want to do is we want to show that this set A is closed. And we're going to do this by showing that its complement is open. All right, so that our claim that we want to prove is that if we look at X without A, so its complement, we want to show that this is open. And the way we're going to do this is by the standard technique of taking some point and finding a neighborhood around that point that is still contained entirely within the set. So we let P lie in the complement of A. Then by our lemma from before, we can find open sets, so disjoint open sets, So let's call these u and v. These are subsets of x, such that on the one hand, a is contained in u, and p, so the singleton set containing p, is contained in v. So this is using the lemma that if we have two compact sets, for example, this set a and this singleton set p, then we can find open disjoint sets that separate them. So that contain each of the corresponding sets. Okay, but now since um, V is disjoint from U and U contains A, this implies that V is contained within the complement of A convince you that this is the case, I'll just draw a picture. So we have this point P, and then we have this set V, which contains P, and we have our set A, and we have uh, U, which contains A, and U and V are disjoint from one another. We want to conclude that V is a subset of the complement of A, which simply means that V is disjoint from A, but of course V is disjoint from A if it's disjoint from U, because A is contained in U. In other words, if there were some point in V which would also lie in A, so I mean you can see from the picture that this is not really possible, um, then that point, because every point in A is a point of U, would also lie in U, which would contradict the fact that V and U are disjoint. Okay, so we set out to prove the claim that um, this complement of A is open, and we've done so by choosing an arbitrary point in the complement, and then used our lemma to find an open neighborhood of that point, namely V, which is contained in the complement. All right, now because X without A is open, this implies that A is closed. And this is exactly what we wanted to show. So in summary, whenever you have a compact subset in a Hausdorff space, then that subset is automatically closed. Moving on, we'll show the next part of this proposition, which states that compact subsets of metric spaces are bounded. So if you have some metric on your topological space and you have a compact set in that metric space, then the compact set will be bounded. And sort of this reinforces maybe the intuition you have of compact sets by now that they're somehow, they're not too big, they're all kind of located in one place. And well, in the context of metric spaces, this turns out to be captured by them being bounded. The proof of this is a basic application of the definition of compactness. So we suppose that X is a metric space and we suppose that we have some compact subset A of X. Now the way we're going to prove that A is bounded is by constructing an open cover of balls that are centered at some point in A. For this we choose some arbitrary point in A and we consider um, the collection of open balls of increasing radius. So I'll call these Bn of A, where n runs through the natural numbers. 
what I mean here is that this is the open ball of radius uh, n centered at the point A. In other words, B and A is defined as the set of all points x and x, such that the distance between A and x is less than uh, n. And this distance is defined because we're in a metric space. So maybe let's call this collection of these open balls B. Now B is an open cover of A, Why is this? Well, each of these open balls is an open set, and it's a cover because if we choose any point in A, so we have, I mean, we have the center A, but now I'm choosing another point, let's say A prime, then A and A prime will be separated by some finite distance. So this distance here will be some number and now by the Archimedean property of the natural numbers, there is always a natural number bigger than any real number. So this distance here will be strictly less than some capital N, which is a natural number. And in particular, this means that if we consider the open ball of radius capital N that uh, has center A, well, then this will contain the point A prime. So. I'm drawing this open ball here, so this would be B, capital N, centered at A, and this contains the point A prime because the distance between A and A prime is strictly less than capital N. Okay, so now we've constructed this uh, open cover of our set A using these open balls centered at some point in A, and now we use the fact that A is compact to obtain a finite subcover. Hence, by compactness, There is a finite subcover of B. And how does this subcover look? Well, we have these open balls centered at A, and they'll be indexed by some finite number of natural numbers. So we'll have like B n1 centered at A up to B n k centered at A. We now consider the maximum of all these numbers that occur as the radii of these open balls. So let's call this number m. So this is the maximum of these ni, where i runs from 1 to k. Now, because all of these balls are nested within each other, it means that those of smaller radius are contained in those of larger radius. Hence, b n i centered at A is contained in this BM centered at A. And this holds for all I uh, running from 1 to K. In particular, because these sets cover A, it means that this single set here, BM centered at A, so the largest one of these open balls, will cover all of A. So this means that actually this largest open ball contains A. So this implies that A is actually contained in this BM centered at A. And this proves the proposition because this is exactly the definition of being a bounded set in the metric space. So being bounded means that you're contained in an open ball of some finite radius. Hence, in summary, if you are a compact subset of a metric space, then you can't be too big in terms of the metric. This brings us to the next property, which is that finite products of compact spaces are again compact. And for this, we'll need the tube lemma we proved previously. So the proof will proceed by induction, basically. So by induction, we can assume that actually we just have two sets which we're taking the product of. Because if we can prove that the product of two compact spaces is compact, then we can just iterate this, and that will show that arbitrary finite products of compact spaces are compact. By induction, it suffices to consider two spaces. And 
x and y, which are compact. And we now need to show that their product will be compact. So for this, we let u be an open cover. of x times y. And we need to show that u has a finite subcover. Now for each point small x in x, the space singleton x times y, so this is like the line we were considering before in the tube lemma. So this is covered by finitely many of the elements of this open cover u. So let's call these u1 and so on up through uk. The reason that we can reduce to finitely many here is because this space here is compact. So this thing here is homeomorphic to y and hence compact. Thus u is also an open cover of this line here, which we've proved is compact, and therefore we can find a finite subcover of u which covers the space. So maybe it's helpful to draw a small picture here. So we have x and y, and this is a space x times y. And we're now picking an x and x and considering this line, which is singleton x times y. And we have this open cover for the entire product space, but now we've reduced to a finite number of these open sets contained in the open cover u that cover this line singleton x times y. So unlike in the tube lemma, these don't necessarily have to be uh, those types of squares. Now in the next step, we're going to apply the tube lemma to the union of these uh, u, i that are covering this line. So by the tube lemma applied to the union of these ui, i running from 1 to k, we can find some neighborhood, which I'll call zx, which is a subset of x. And well, this zx also contains the point small x. This will be open such that if we take the product of zx with y, this is contained within the union of these ui. So what we've done here is we've found some tube whose base is the set zx, and this tube is contained entirely within this finite union of the ui. We're now going to use the idea we've used many times before, which is that if we have some way of constructing some open set, in this case zx, for any point in some space, in this case capital X, then we can just vary that point and we obtain an open cover. So the collection zx, where x runs through all the points in capital X, is an open cover of x. Now by assumption, x is compact, so hence there is a finite subcover which I'll call z1 running through, let's say, zj. And this is a finite subcover which still well, covers x, so it's a subcover of this original cover of all the zx. Now the last step of the proof will be putting the things we established together, so let's quickly review. We started with u, an open cover of the product x times y, and then we saw that for each point small x in the space x, we can cover this line by finitely many of the elements of u, which I called here uh, u1 through uk. Moreover, by the tube lemma, we can construct a tube which is contained in all of these, and whose base is given by some open set zx, which contains the point small x. And finally, if we vary this point small x, we obtain an open cover of the space x, which we can reduce to a finite subcover using compactness of x.
Now, since these z1 through zj cover x, this means that if we look at the tubes, so each of these zi times y, all of these tubes will cover the product space. So if we look at the tubes um, zi times y for i running from 1 to j, so these cover uh, the product space x times y. Moreover, if we look at any one of these tubes, so for example, the one in this picture, these tubes are covered by a finite number of sets that were contained in the original open cover U. Moreover, each tube, zi times y, is covered by finitely many of the sets in the open cover U. I'll just call these ui in u. So now we're done because we know that the product space is covered by these tubes and these tubes, well, we have finitely many of these tubes, remember? So we have these z1 through zj, this is a finite number. So the product space is covered by finitely many tubes and each of the tubes is covered by finitely many of the ui. So in order to get a finite subcover of u, you just need to take all the uis for each of these tubes, and those will in total cover the entire um, product space. All right, with that, we're done with this part of the proof. So if we have two compact spaces and we look at their product, that product will again be compact. Now, in fact, this type of theorem holds in more generality, so you don't have to assume that the products be finite. Um, in fact, one can prove that products so arbitrary products, even infinite products of compact spaces remain compact. Just so you know, so the, this general theorem is called Tikhonov's theorem, which doesn't necessarily assume that the products be finite. And as you can imagine, if you drop this assumption, the proof also becomes correspondingly more complicated. Finally, we'll turn to the last part of the proposition, which states that quotients of compact spaces are again compact. Luckily, the proof of this is really easy. It follows directly from a proposition we saw in the previous video, namely that the images of compact sets under continuous functions are again compact. So we let y be a quotient of some space x. So then we have a quotient map which goes from x to y. So this is some quotient map q. And well, this is continuous and it's rejective. So hence y is actually the image of x under this quotient map q. And from this it follows then that y is compact. Well, since images of compact spaces under continuous functions are compact. So basically, this is exactly the same situation we had for connectedness. There, we also proved that the images of connected spaces under continuous maps are again connected. And this implied that then quotients of connected spaces would again be connected. And this is exactly the same thing. We're just now applying it for compact spaces. OK, so that's all I have to say for this video. Um, in summary, we saw some important properties of compact subsets. In the next video, we'll be specializing to Euclidean space and giving a characterization of the compact sets in Euclidean space. And moreover, we'll also be proving um, a version of the extreme value theorem, which holds for general compact spaces.